Hello, I am delighted to welcome you to this webinar, which is one of a series of webinars hosted by Divine Renovation and Alpha Together. My name is Kitty K. Shuttleworth, and I oversee Alpha in the Catholic Church globally, and I am in London. Our mission at Alpha is to equip and serve the church in its mission to help people discover and develop a relationship with Jesus. And Divine Renovation exists to inspire, connect, and equip priests and their parishes to go from maintenance to mission. And today's webinar is an opportunity for us to consider together the question, what is God saying to the church today? And we are delighted to have with us for this conversation, Bishop Robert Barron, Father James Mallon, and Nikki Gumbel. And it is always such a joy to have guests with us from all over the world, today from over 85 countries. So we want to welcome those of you that are joining us live and those of you watching a recording or gathering together for a watch party. We have over 300 watch parties happening all over the world. So in the chat, as you have been already, please do say hello tell us where you're from and do tag us as well on social media. And just so you all know, this webinar will last 60 minutes and we are recording it. So you'll be able to access it again and to share it with others. And interpretations are available. So do select your language at the bottom of the screen. In a minute, we are gonna open in prayer, praying in particular for the critical situation today in Ukraine. But before we do that, I'm delighted to introduce to you our speakers today. So Bishop Robert Barron, as many of you will know, is the founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries and Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. His website, wordonfire.org, reaches millions of people each year, and he's one of the world's most followed Catholics on social media. Nikki Gumbel is Vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton, an Anglican church in central London, and he's the pioneer of Alpha, an introduction to the Christian faith, which is run by churches of all traditions in over 100 countries. He's married to Pippa, and together they write a commentary on the Bible in one year. Father James Mallon is parish priest of Our Lady of Guadeloupe Parish in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia in Canada and he is the founder of Divine Renovation Ministry and the author of several books on how Catholic parishes and dioceses can make the move from maintenance to mission. And finally, Fiona O'Reilly, who's going to host our conversation today, is the Director of Global Strategy for Divine Renovation. As part of her role, she works with bishops and priests in dioceses and parishes across the US, Canada, UK, Ireland, Australia, and India. And I'm gonna hand over to Fiona now, who's gonna open our time together in prayer. Thank you, Kitty. And as we you know, have a webinar today, thinking about what is God saying, the very best place that we can start is by listening to him, by turning to him. Amen. So let's open in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Father, we bless you and we praise you for this chance to come together today to think about what you are saying to your church so that we as your sons and daughters might better respond. We ask that you would send us your spirit. Give us ears and hearts and minds that are open to you. Give us lives that are docile to the breath of your spirit and give us the courage to love, to pray and to act as followers of Christ in this day. And Father, we especially lift up to you today, the people of Ukraine, and especially the many people in Russia also who do not want this war. We pray for them, Lord, and we pray for peace. And we ask that you would give each one of us the grace, the strength we need to resist evil in ourselves and wherever we find it. We pray that you would help us to act so as to make your kingdom present. And that in this hour, you would speak your words to each one of us in whatever way is most for the glory of your name. Bless our time together and bless this conversation. We make these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 
So thank you. Thank you to our speakers for joining us today for this conversation. And thank you to you, each of our guests. We have been praying for you uh, over the last several weeks, and we are so pleased that you could make the time to come and be with us today. And you know, this marks two years. Two years ago today, the pandemic hit our world, upending our lives in so many different ways. And there have been other challenges since, challenges to do with racism, climate change, social and economic difficulties. And when we were putting together this webinar, we really wanted to create a space for us as a church to think about what is God saying through all of this? Because we trust in a God who makes all things work for good who permits sometimes difficult things to happen, but who always has a path forward for us through it. But we never dreamt that when we would sit down for this conversation, we would be six days into a war in Europe, 650,000 refugees would be on the move. And as people of faith, we need to pray and we need to act. We need to respond to these events and the wider setting in which they sit in order to see the world change for good. So let's start with where we are right now. You know, crisis can shake us. It can leave us feeling confused, angry, overwhelmed, upset, wanting to act, but not sure what to do. So for each of our guests, can you each share briefly, you know, your thoughts as Christians, you know, how might we respond in light of the current events unfolding in Ukraine? And Bishop Barron, I'll come to you first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me at this wonderful event. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to be addressing so many people around the world. And you're right, it's a, it's a painful time we're going through. Christians are peacemakers. We don't just sit on the sidelines passively. But our job, we're salt and light. We're meant to make a difference. And one of the prime ways we do that is to be peacemakers. Um, so it's a time for action. You're right. And Christians... When we sit on the sidelines, we allow a lot of the negative powers to have their way. I think, you know, a lot of the crisis of the faith in Europe was caused by the fact that so many Christians, let's face it, in the 20th century, uh, sat on the sidelines or even participated in the terrible, you know, wrenching violence of, of the last century. So our job is to get in the way of violence. I was very impressed by Pope Francis' recent move where uh, going against all protocol, he went directly and personally to the Russian embassy in the, in the Vatican to express his concern, his desire to help. I was also impressed by his call to everybody, not just Catholics, but to all Christians, as Lent begins tomorrow, uh, that we pray. And we all know that. I imagine everyone listening to this uh, webinar knows that the power of prayer. Prayer is not just pious, wishful thinking. Prayer accomplishes something. And so we pray very intentionally, purposefully. But also the Pope said we fast. And how important that tomorrow is, is a prime fast day within the church. Why does that work? I mean, why does fasting work? I don't know entirely the, the mm -hmm. physics or the metaphysics of it. I just know the Lord recommended it. It's been recommended by the great spiritual masters up and down the centuries. Somehow, the sacrifice made by certain members in the body of Christ has a, an effective power throughout the mystical body. And so two things we can do, every single one of us, especially tomorrow as Lent commences, we can pray and we can fast. But our basic task is to get in the way of evil and to be peacemakers. Thank you, Bishop Barron. Father James? As we started our call today and I saw all the, the names of the countries coming up, it was very overwhelming. In fact, at one point, I, I found myself almost moved to tears and I saw uh, Poland, Slovenia. And I think of how we are, we are united as a real experience of the communion of saints right now, uh, globally, uh, looking at the purpose of, you know, who is God calling us to be? The, the church is called to be the church at any time and age and to be faithful to our core identity. And, and I, th I think, you know, big yes to everything that Bishop Barron has, has said. I, I found, you know, these last few days thinking in, in my own life that, that in terms of emotion, one of the primary emotions that I felt was a kind of unsettling fear, uh, a disorientation. Uh, so much of what we took for granted, you know, the fact that our, our uh, global uh, community was on a, 
uh, a continuous march towards embracing liberal democracy and all of the apparent stability that comes with that and predictability. And here we are in a, very quickly in a very unpredictable place with someone who seems to have psychopathic tendencies, who has a, a red button and who's threatening to use it. And this is a this is a time of trial like no other. This is a time of 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 testing. And I was reflecting yesterday on the first reading at mass, which was uh, from First Peter chapter one, that speaks about how you know uh, rejoicing in times of trial because there are times of purification of our faith. And and this is ultimately about faith as trust. You know, faith is, is faith is 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 trust in God, not just believing in God, but actually believing God. And I don't know about everyone else on this call, but um, in my own weakness, I, I find in my own life that I'm only really forced to deepen my faith, my grounding in God, when all of my other, the, the false things that I rely on are actually removed from me. And so I think that's often why in time of trial, we're invited to a deeper faith. And yes, the faith has to translate into action, but for us to be really effective uh, and faithful to what the Lord is calling us to do as the church, we need to be truly, truly grounded. And and perhaps as we experience the uncertainty and the fear of the present moment, that it's a it coincides with the grace of Lent. The the purple uh, is already up in our church for mass tomorrow. That that this is a time of renewal. Why? So the church could be more fully the church in the world. Thank you, Father James and Nikki. Well, I agree, of course, uh, with everything that Bishop Barron and Father James have said. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I love the people of Ukraine. I, I love the people of Russia. We haven't, we had our, uh, with us at our staff meeting this morning, we had our national coordinator for Alpha in Ukraine and his daughter who, uh, uh, he's the national director, his daughter's the national coordinator. And uh, I love the people of Ukraine and they have, the, there's a hundred churches there running Alpha, but I also love the people of Russia Joining us on our, uh, on our call was also our national directors in the, of, the Alpha office in, in Russia. And uh, we've done many conferences in Russia. We love the people of Russia. Um, and millions of people in Russia are against this war. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, But I, I feel this is not a time for the church to sort of keep out of politics. Uh, I feel very strongly about it personally because my father uh, was Jewish. He was uh, German. He was um, uh, stopped from practicing in 1933 as a lawyer in Germany. Um, and um, my grandparents got out pretty much on the last boat. Um, and uh, as has been said, unless we learn the lessons of history, we're destined to repeat them. And so, and, and again, as has been, been said, it's not, it's not you know, the voice of the enemies, it's the silence of our friends. So I think this is a time, not a time for the church to stay out of politics. This is a time for the church to pray, of course, for, uh, as Bishop Barron has so eloquently stated, prayer makes a difference. We must pray. And uh, I, I'm delighted to see uh, the Pope leading in, in this way. Um, uh, but I think it, we also need to act. We need to speak out. Everyone needs to use their voice to speak out and not to mince words. Evil is evil. And uh, the invasion of a sovereign country uh, unprovoked un is, is a barbaric act and bombing, um, uh, indiscriminate bombing of, uh, of civilians, women and children being killed is evil and we must name it and as the apostle paul tells us in the book of romans do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good and this is the time for the church to rise up and to act and to speak out and to give uh, to give money that's needed to give resources that are needed and to give hospitality that, that is needed and to open the doors. Let's not make the mistake of what happened in the 1930s. Let's make sure that every refugee is welcomed with open arms in any country that they wish to go to and is looked after, loved, given hospitality by the church. And the church should take the lead. This needs a unity between Catholics, Orthodox, 
Protestant and Pentecostals united to pray, act, and to lead by example. And the world should see that the church is at the forefront of this action in overcoming evil with good. Thank you, Nikki. And I just I, I love that that call that that is there for each one of us. You know that the most loving thing we can do as Christians is be Christian, because actually in doing that, we will be the light that the world needs to, to see. And it's, you know, that that call to, to prayer, that call to act are two sides of, of one coin. They go hand in hand. Action and, and prayer well united uh, is part and parcel of who we are as disciples of Christ. And one of the things that I was just really struck there by Bishop Barron was, you know, that, that call to be peacemakers. We are, are to be doers of the word, not hearers only. You know, in, in another way, I've heard it put, you know, we're, we're called to be thermostats, not thermometers. We are not called simply to, to reflect reality or wring our hands over it. We are called to change reality through our prayer and our action in our spheres of influence. And that's a call that, that you know, is echoing deep in our hearts today because of this situation in, in Ukraine. But I'm also conscious that the events of the, the last six days and, and last several weeks haven't happened in a vacuum. They, they have followed on from an incredibly challenging two years, two years of difficulties, of, of trials, but also amazing opportunities to, to share the good news. Because so often God uses events to open up new paths for us. He also uses it sometimes to reveal to ourselves first of all and then more widely what's really there and to give us ways that we can respond in new and creative fashions and ways of reaching out that we have not had before because he's not done with the world so we're not done yet in following him and what i'd love to to hear now from each one of you is your reflections on what you think the last two years has revealed specifically about how the church is fulfilling her mission to make disciples. And perhaps Father James, I, I could invite you to go first. Well, I think in, in thinking over this, it's kind of a, I think it was a bit of a bad news, good news story. And the, the underlying issue is, is a big question that's haunted me for many, many years. And that's, are we, are we more connected with or attached to our, our method that, than our mission? Because if you look at what we actually do in spite of what we say is the church time and time again we the, the mission seems to be to maintain the method methods that were forged in a very very different reality and one of the things that happened with covid in you know almost two years ago this coming week in march when things get shut down our, our core method for for most for our for many christian traditions which was what it was to provide pastoral care to people who showed up in a building and it was like someone just turned the lights off and that was removed from us and I think what it revealed initially was kind of a bad news story that, that indeed we were so attached to particular methods that we were paralyzed. And it took uh, many churches uh, quite a long time to be able to get around to shifting because the, the irony was that in order to even reach our own people to care for the sheep in a sense, mm. to, to do maintenance ministry, because maintenance ministry isn't just you know, caring for buildings, it's caring for the flock. That God has entrusted to us, in order to care for our own, we had to assume an outward uh, posture. We had to become that church that, that goes out to, 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 to meet our own. So the bad news was it revealed how, uh, how little prepared we were to do this and how attached we were to the mission. But the, the good news story was that, you know, it's actually, it marks one of the, one of the greatest pastoral and innovations in the history, at least of many mainline churches in the embrace of technology uh, online uh, and, and being innovative in many ways, even for, for things like how do we care for our own people? How do we reach people? How do we celebrate sacraments in the midst of this, of this new reality? So it showed that we actually are able to innovate. And, and here's the challenge for us is because the, the truth is that, that this pandemic, and I know that many of our countries are in different stages of, of lifting the, the restrictions, uh, that this is, was not just disruptive change, uh, or sorry, this was not just an interruption, uh, as if it's all going to go back to the way it was. This, is, this was disruptive change. The, the, as the dust begins to settle and we get a sense of where we are, our reality is fundamentally changed. In many ways, I believe it's the, it, it's the end of the final chapter of, of cultural Christianity, cultural Catholicism, because I don't know about what you guys are experiencing in your parish, but in my parish, we're, we're, we're seeing this, that, you know, the people who came out of mere 
obligation or a sense of guilt or duty. You know, the truth is that many of these folks have decided that, you know, they didn't miss church that much and they didn't feel too guilty about it. So uh, there will be a certain number who will not come back. Um, and so that's, that's a challenge for us. But the, tr- the point is that we did assume a kind of outward posture. We did show an ability to, to um, embrace new methods and to innovate. And, and let's keep on going because the truth is that pre-COVID, the church actually wasn't doing that well. <laughs> So let's keep going in, in, in the trajectory that we're on now. Thank you. Bishop Barron, love to hear your thoughts on that, that same question. Yeah, I might use that same hermeneutic of good news, bad news, because uh, I quite agree. First of all, part of the good news is that we learned how to use new methods. Uh, how many of my pastors in my pastoral region here now know all about live streaming? They have cameras, they have video systems and so on. And that's, I think, all to the good. The church has, has uh, used these methods. I've been saying for a long time, people aren't coming readily to our institutions. I mean, so Catholics are very institutional. We build a parish, we build schools, we build the hospitals, people will come to them. Well, that's happening less and less. And I've been saying, along with many others, it's part of the new evangelization, we got to find ways to go out. Pope Francis talks about getting out of the sacristies. Well, one of the ways to do that is to use these uh, technologies. And I think the COVID crisis might have prompted that in a way that nothing else would have. Another thing under the rubric of good news, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I wrote a, a little article where I said, it might be a Pascalian moment. What I meant was, Pascal said, you know, that most of us spend most of our lives with diversions. So instead of engaging the great questions, we divert ourselves, we distract ourselves with all sorts of trivialities. And, and that's how we spend most of our lives. And he said, the, the reason most of us are unhappy is we can't sit with ourselves quietly in a room. In other words, to entertain the really deep questions. At the beginning of the crisis, I think we were all kind of forced on retreat. <laughs> we, we had to shut down. We, we couldn't go to our places of, of entertainment and sports and so on. And I said, maybe it's an opportunity for us to reflect and to pray and to think and to read. And maybe that spiritual classic you haven't looked at for a long time, this is your opportunity. So I think there was something valuable there in the kind of forced retreat that we had. Now, let me say something quick about what I think is a negative side of this thing. Uh, look, I'm, I'm a bishop out here in California. I was part of a team that, that affirmed in the early days of the pandemic, we got to protect our people and you know we shut down the churches and all of that, which I think was the right thing to do at that time. And the minute we could, so in California, it was in June of 2020, we did open the churches. Mass was usually outdoors and with mass and all of that. So in the beginning, I think we, we had to be you know, protective toward our people. Here's what bugged me, though, as the crisis continued to unfold, is this famous distinction, at least we had it over here in, in my country, between the essential and the non-essential. You know, so we recognize certain parts of life are really essential. And so despite the pandemic, we got to continue with these things and, you know, grocery stores and doctor's offices. But also, also, at least out here in California, um, you know, strip clubs and uh, places to buy marijuana and various other were recognized as essential to life. The churches were not. The churches were placed on the non-essential side of the equation. The fact that way too many of us, and I'll use that you know, term in very inclusively, too many of us believers kind of at least implicitly accepted that uh, demarcation is a really bad sign because it means we've succumbed to modernity's uh, teaching that religion is fine as a hobby. Some people are really into it. Some are less into it. Some aren't into it at all, but it's kind of a private hobby. It's not essential to your life. That's a, a teaching, I think, of 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 the more radical voice of modernity. We can't succumb to that. Religion is essential to life. And you know that Father James talked about the the issue of of mortal sin and so on. Uh, I don't want to recover it the way it was used, but I think that language is dead right. In other words, it's spiritually speaking, mortally dangerous to stay away from the worship of God on a regular basis. I'm not trying to reimagine God as some, you know, tyrannical force. I'm just saying it's spiritual physics. You stay away from the worship of God on a regular basis. You're doing damage, indeed mortal damage, to your spirit, to your soul. If we accept the rhetoric of the secular culture that what we're into is somehow non-essential to the the project of human flourishing, 
then we've surrendered way, way, way too much. So I, I think what's happened is in the pandemic, a kind of fault line emerged. And it's good for us to be aware of it. And that we need to be clearly on, on the side of that fault line that says, no, the essential, the essential uh, is, is the religious realm. Uh, so I think that's a good question for all of us religious people to entertain. What has the pandemic taught us about what we really value? Our physical health, of course, of course. But our, our spiritual health, I mean, it profits a man nothing to gain the whole world and lose his soul, Right. So how, how do we value and treasure the spiritual? Do we see it as essential? To me, it's a good question that this pandemic has raised. Thank you. And Nikki? Well, again, of course, I agree with everything that Bishop Barron and Father James have, have said. Uh, I think the pandemic was uh, horrific. Uh, it was a horrible disease, um, terrible suffering, um, deaths, illnesses, sicknesses, loss of loved ones, people not being able to be with their loved ones when they were dying. But, you know, God is able to take something horrific and use it for good. And the supreme example of that is the cross. God took the, the worst event in the history of the world, the crucifixion of the Son of God, and he used it for the salvation of the world. And I think God did take the pandemic and uh, use it in many ways for good. Um, and uh, one of the things I think, uh, uh, I, I don't know whether you know this, but The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark. He's, he's, an, he's not, I don't, as far as I know, he's not a Christian, but he's analyzing how the, uh, the church grew in the early centuries. And chapter four is the epidemics, the pandemics. Mm. It was during the pandemics that the church grew rapidly because the pagans in those days ran away, whereas the Christians ran towards the need. And I think that's what we've seen here is the Christians running towards the need. I mean, we started a little thing here called Love Your Neighbor. It spread to other churches. So far, we've done 20 million meals. Uh, but there's been a huge response um, from people just uh, saying, you know, thank you that the church was there on the front line, feeding the doctors, the, the nurses, getting the hot meals, providing medicines, uh, getting out there. And actually the church is at the forefront of, um, and even the government backed us and gave us money because they could see that actually, who do people turn to in this time of need? It's the churches that run the homeless shelters. It's the churches that provide of, uh, the food banks. It's the churches that do all these things. So it was a huge opportunity at that level. I think it was also, it is now a huge opportunity. And I think this is the greatest opportunity in my lifetime for evangelization, because as both Father James and Bishop Barron have said, uh, of this and the, the last great revolution was Gutenberg and the printing press that enabled everyone to get the Bible into their own hands. And now we have this. And um, what uh, the pandemic has accelerated is technology. And we now have the opportunity, like this is the, the greatest opportunity for acceleration of evangelization in my lifetime. And I think for 500 years, because now we have the opportunity through the technology to get the gospel to every person on the planet. And we have coming up 2033, uh, which will be, as you all know, the 17th of April in the um, in the West will be the 2000th anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus. And I think in the next uh, 11 years, uh, we have the opportunity to try and make the gospel, the good news of Jesus available to everyone on the planet. And I think God has given us the instrument and the pandemic has accelerated that. Thank you, all three of you. It's just it's just so interesting to hear that about the good news and the bad news dimensions to, to the reality that we've got at the moment, because it's so easy to focus on on perhaps the difficult side of this. And we need to acknowledge that. But equally, there have been and continue to be opportunities because crisis reveals it, it reveals what we put first, what we value, where we stand, how the wider culture views where we're coming from. But it also clarifies it has the effect of making us decide what we're going to put first. 
what do we think is the main thing? And so I'd, I'd love for us to, to spend a little bit of time now just exploring, you know, what is the most urgent call for the church right now in terms of her mission and why? And perhaps Bishop Barron, you could maybe speak to that first. Well, it remains the one it's been from the very beginning, uh, declaring Jesus Christ risen from the dead. That's evangelization. I go back to um, one of my great mentors, Cardinal Francis George of Chicago, who died just before I came out here to California as a bishop. And it was the very last talk he gave to the priests of Chicago and on our presbyteral day. And what he said was, remember, brothers, that at the beginning of the church, there were no parishes, there were no schools, there were no hospitals, there was no Vatican, there was no curia, there were no seminaries, there were no chancery offices. <laughs> but there were evangelists. And I thought it was a marvelous talk. It was a prophetic talk because, you know, we're at a time of institutional crisis. We all know that. And, and the famous distinction, which I really like about maintenance mission, uh, if we're all about the maintaining of our institutions, we're, we're going to miss the central project. Mm. There were always evangelists at the beginning. And that's the essential element in the life of the church to the present day. Our job is not primarily to maintain our institutions. We maintain them in the measure that they're effective means of declaring Jesus risen from the dead. But the priority is the declaration. And as Nikki was saying, I think quite rightly, you know, that with this explosion of, of technology, it is, I quite agree, the greatest revolution since Gutenberg and the greatest opportunity. Uh, that's the pressing need of the church, that we know what we're about. And again, see, maybe the Lord leads us into a sort of institutional crisis to remind us of that, not to eliminate the institutions. I mean, I'm a bishop of the church. I'm an institution man. You know, I supervise 40 parishes out here in California. But we have to know what the institution is for. It's for the sake of the declaration of the resurrection. So maybe the institutional crisis is meant to awaken our sense of priority once again. Declaring Jesus crucified and risen from the dead, that's the life of the church. That's everything. Uh, if we forget that, we forget our own identity. So go back to the earliest days and then recover that same elan. I think that's still the call of our time. Thank you. Father James? You know, when I first saw the title of this discussion, you know, what is God saying to the church? I thought, well, the same thing as he was saying last week <laughs> and the <laughs> week before that. I mean, our context may, may change from time to time, but, but essentially it's the same thing. And this uh, centrality of the, the great commandment and the great commission and, you know, I think back in my own spiritual journey, you know, I was a, raised as a church-going Catholic, wasn't that into it. And, but as a teenager, had a profound experience of Jesus on, on a retreat that I was forced to go to. It was a retreat that was hosted by one of the movements within the church. And in that community, I found really deep Christian community that I never thought was possible. I was discipled. Uh, we experienced vibrant worship. I served in ministry. We went out and evangelized. And in those early years, I noticed such a profound difference between what was normative in this movement and then I go to my parish. And there seemed to be this gulf. And, and the parish was this, the, this culture of, of minimalism. I, I didn't have those words to describe it at the time, but I felt it. And, and I remember as a, as a 16-year-old thinking, why, why? But why can't what I experience on Wednesday night when people come from all over the city I mean, if, if parishes were like this, the, the world would be transformed. It would, it would bring total renewal and revival if we actually got it right. And that was really the beginning of, of a, a passionate seed that was in my heart before I went into the seminary and throughout my time in, in, in formation. And as a pastor, it's been the, the, the driving question of my life that there, there seems to be something in our Catholic um, firmware, I'll, I'll say, that, that, that stops us from moving from uh, a beautiful theology to actually doing it. I mean, the movements can do it. They do it beautifully, and thank God for that. But what with the, what's up with the parish? <laughs> That's been my biggest question. And I think back to the recent Vatican document, uh, July 2020, on the, the pastoral conversion of the parish for the sake of the evangelizing mission of the church, one of those Vatican long statements. We Around here, we just call it the new document. And, uh, the, you know, it quoted John Paul II from 1984 from an address to the Congregation of the Clergy, where he said that evangelization must be the cornerstone of all our pastoral action. It's primary, preeminent, and preferential. And I was really struck by those three Ps. And, and I think of a preeminence often has to do with, with our official theology. And 
we have no problem as Catholics proclaiming the preeminence of evangelization. Primary, I think, is about putting it into action. Well, we we struggle with that because we often don't have a model. And then preferential is, I think, is a, a, about being open about the fact that it's that it's first. And we still tend to be shy about that because to somehow to push evangelization means somehow I'm against the sacraments or catechesis as if they were somehow in competition. But as a young priest going into a parish for the first time with that same burning question in my heart and feeling the the pain of 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 a church that just seemed to be a little lifeless, <laughs> so, so to speak. And my big question was, how do I wake this up? And, and that's actually when, when someone introduced me to Alpha. And I, just, I know that, Nikki, you're, you're here. But I just want to, I just thank God for how God has used uh, what has been beautifully discovered and implemented through, through your, your church. Because over the years, it's been 20 years now uh, that I've been using Alpha. And I've seen a disproportionate impact for evangelization, remember, Alpha is not catechesis, it's evangelization, but I've seen it not just transform people, but in time transform parishes. And I saw, in a sense, you know, obviously any tool, many tool, God can use any tool, but I, but I saw what I had yearned for as a, as, a, as a teenager, that I saw parishes begin to embody what my experience of the movements had at one point. Thank you. And Nikki, as, as you know, from where you're standing, as you think about the most urgent call for the church, anything that you'd add to that reflection? I love what Bishop Barron says about declaring Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. And, um, uh, you know, I was, I, my, as I said, my father was Jewish, a secular Jew. My mother was not a churchgoer. And I encountered Jesus at the age of 18 um, through reading the New Testament. It was as if the person of Jesus emerged from the New Testament and I encountered him. It changed my life. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it in all its fullness. And I discovered that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And from that moment onwards, I, I just wanted to spend my rest, the rest of my life telling people, because I think the most loving thing that you can do is, tell, is, is lead someone to Jesus. We need to provide food for the hungry. We need to do all those things. But the most loving thing we can do is introduce someone to Jesus. And what I see now is a massive hunger amongst everyone, really, young people in particular. Everybody is looking for love. And uh, we know that the, the way that you know that you're loved is the son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus died for you. Uh, we need to experience his love through the Holy Spirit coming into our hearts. Everyone's looking for purpose. And ultimately, you will not find the purpose of your life until you uh, encounter, you know, God through Jesus. And everyone's looking to belong. And uh, it, the church is not just an organization you join. It's a family where you belong. And that's what everyone's looking for. And uh, that's why uh, you know, I think this is such an amazing opportunity because I think people are more open than they've ever been. They're searching and we have the best news. We have the good news of Jesus. What a wonderful privilege it is to introduce. It's the greatest privilege I think that anyone can have. Uh, like, you know, Andrew brought his brother Peter to Jesus. What a privilege for Andrew to see his brother Peter then have such an impact on the world. Um, and it's the greatest privilege that we have is to introduce people to Jesus and to declare Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. He's alive. Amen. Thank you, Nikki. You know, I'm what I'm struck, and I, certainly in my role working with with parishes and dioceses, with priests, bishops, and lay people from around the world. You know, there's there's so many people now who you know that that just clarity that evangelization has got to take that first place, has got to be primary, preeminent and preferential. But, but often, while the, while the desire for that is there, people are struggling with, well, how do I do this? Like in concrete terms, in the context where we are in now, uh, with all of the challenges, all of the opportunities, what does this look like in practice if I want to make evangelization the main thing? And I know as, as, as founders of three very different global ministries, but all with a focus on evangelization, I would just love to get each of your thoughts on what making an evangelization as a priority could look like 
for real today. So Bishop Barron, perhaps we come to you first. I'll say a couple things. Um, you know, it's a complex issue, but here's a very, very practical thing, especially in light of COVID. People were already staying away. Now they're staying away in greater numbers. So maybe half of our people have come back to church out here in California. Um, but the evangelists have to be the people that are coming to church. And when they go forth, you know, go, the mass is ended, go forth, glorify the Lord by your life. Part of what that means is bring somebody back next week. I, I don't know everybody in the parish who's, who's staying away, but you know somebody, everyone there. So I've been saying that at the end of every mass that I celebrate out here is, okay, next week, every one of you has got to be directly and personally an evangelist to bring somebody back. Here's a second observation. Uh, as I study the issue of disaffiliation, especially among the young, again and again, what comes forward are intellectual objections that young people have, questions that were never answered. Religion and science are at odds with each other. It doesn't make any sense. I don't believe the great narrative. And so many people come to me and say, you know, my kids, they just, they don't believe it. They don't understand it. And I'll say, well, get educated, <laughs> read, study. There's been an explosion happily, I think, of Catholic apologetics, Christian apologetics, and there are the Lord using something negative for good. The, the new atheists, go back now 20 years, the new atheists, I think, roused within us a deeper interest in explaining the faith, understanding the faith, making it available through the new media. Get educated, read, study, listen, talk to people so that you can evangelize more effectively. Not that it's reduced to, you know, apologetics, but that's part of it, to become more articulate in your Christian faith. You know what you believe. You have the capacity verbally and intellectually to communicate that to people. Um, I think that's very important for those who are still coming to Mass, those who are still coming to our institutions, get educated, and then you become an evangelist yourself particularly by bringing someone back to back to church. Thank you. Mm. And Father James, I know you're experiencing this coming from a parish context, but also having having worked at the diocesan level. What what would you know, what would you be saying in terms of here's how this can be a priority in practice? Yeah, we need to recognize that uh, evangelization is the responsibility of, of every every part, every dimension, every institution of the church has the responsibility to 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 proclaim the Lord. My particular passion is 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 to see local churches, parishes mobilize for, in a sense, communal evangelization. It's a classic both and. We've got to equip uh, our people to be missionary disciples, to do uh, individual evangelization. But I love communal evangelization because I'm not all that good at it by myself. <laughs> and when we do it communally, it and normalize it within a parish, incredible things happen. It stops just being the small group of weird people who do it, but it begins to be owned and become, begins to be normalized. And, and I think if you're coming from a, a more secular context like Canada or the UK or other countries, you know, you may have a celebration of the Eucharist that will be very welcoming and engaging for people who have no experience of church, but in some instances, that might not be the best place to start. So I would say that in, I'm back in a parish now a year and a half in a brand new parish that really didn't have any tradition of evangelization or adult discipleship. You know, it was the typical thing that the only Catholics expected to grow and learn in their faith are children. Adults don't, don't do that. We, we don't have to do that. And so we're starting from, from the beginning. And I believe that, that leaders, uh, pastors, uh, parish priests, bishops, you got to spend some time casting vision, you know, talking about the why, the why, the why, the why. We've got to do it over and over and over again. And I think that's, that's, the, that's we've got to preach kind of like the big story, the meta narrative of the church. What's her core purpose in, in a way that people can grasp it? But it's not enough to explain it intellectually. You know, people are never going to be won over by ideas. They've got to eventually feel something. And, and so we need to move to action. But to move to action, we also need a clear definition. I, I think we had a meeting of clergy just very, very recently on this topic, and it struck me again and again, we constantly as Catholics confuse evangelization with what we would call pre-evangelization and post-evangelistic catechesis or discipleship. We, we constantly conflate them or like was the, the trend 10, 15 years ago when new evangelization was a thing, we called everything evangelization or new evangelization. So we need to be clear on our definitions uh, in parishes, we need to shift resources. And many good parishes are busy. We do so many things as Catholics. We keep adding, adding, adding new things, and we rarely take away. 
And, and we need to have a serious evaluation because if we want to head out in a path of mission, we've got to do it in a sustainable way. And here's another grace of COVID. I mean, a lot of uh, things we were doing that, that weren't really bearing a lot of fruit, COVID shut them down. So for literally, for God's sake, let's not start them back up again because uh, energy and time and resources are, are, are finite. And lastly, I would say to parishes and to all you parish leaders there, choose a tool. You know, at Divine Renovation, we, we love Alpha, but we work with parishes who use other evangelistic tools. Uh, what matters is that you choose a tool for communal evangelization. You commit to it, do it, evaluate it. You know, ask the question, uh, are people who are outside the church actually coming? Because sometimes when we ask that question of, of parishes the, well, who talk about their evangelistic programs, it turns out the only people taking them are church-going parishioners. It's like, you're still not reaching anyone. We need to be serious about, about uh, evaluating that. And finally, let's remember that uh, evangelization has many distinct movements in it. It be, begins with proclamation, but then leads to accompaniment and helping people to grow to experience encounter with Jesus and then to move into relationship with Jesus, then to, to make commitments and ultimately to bring them to the sacraments. Because here's the thing, a farmer who only scatters seed is going to be very hungry at the end of the day. We've got to be concerned about bringing in the harvest as well. Mm. Thank you, Father James. And Nikki, lastly, I'd just love to get, get your thoughts, kind of what, what's one way in which we can really make evangelization a priority, practically speaking? Well, thank God for all of you. I mean, I thank God for you, uh, Bishop Barron, because, you know, what we need is intellectuals taking on um, the new atheists um, uh, in the marketplace. And, you know, you think back in the past, you had the G.K. Chesterton's others who were able to we were all proud you know there was a there was a you could see as c.s lewis was out there yeah. you know there are people who 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 stood up for the faith and were able, and when i listened to your discussion with jordan peterson i thought you know thank god for for bishop Barron, who's able to uh uh rowan williams is another one who's able to take uh, archbishop rowan williams able to debate um uh and i know um uh uh, Father Raniero Cantalamessa does it um, in, in Italy. And, you know, this is uh, this needs to happen. And thank God for Father, uh, Father James, what you're doing is providing a practical model for ordinary people who can get involved in evangelism, who, are, who don't necessarily, you know, I don't see myself as, as an in, intellectual, but I want to do evangelism at a, at a very, um, uh, you know, on the ground level. Uh, you know, f uh, to go back to Father Raniero Cantalamessa, who is one of my my heroes. No, he's not uh, long. He's now Cardinal Cardinal, Cardinal Raniero <laughs> at Cantalamessa, but has been a great friend to us for many many years. And I I have uh, amongst all the, uh, this these books, most of them not worth reading, but there is a section over here of the complete works of Father Raniero Cantalamessa. Um, and you know, and, and there are three themes in his, as I'm sure you all know, that I, in all the talks that that I've read of read of his, and often ones which the popes that he's preached to have have um, also uh, focused around um, evangelization, unity, and the Holy Spirit. And I think uh, I love that because they go together. You know, if we're going to, uh, Jesus prayed, well, Jesus, first of all, has told us to go out and make disciples of all nations. We got, we've got that commission. Um, but he also prayed that we might be one in order that the world will believe. And if we are arguing amongst ourselves, the world is not going to believe. Mm -hmm. But if you, we unite, then the world's going to ask, what are we united about? And uh, we unite around Jesus. We, we, we are all followers of Jesus. We all, are, we all are sons and daughters of God the Father. We all have the Holy Spirit living within us. And if we can, and as Father Raniero always says, what unites us is therefore far greater, infinitely greater than what divides us. So unity. Um, <clears throat> And then the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, you will be, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. And it's not just that we're filled with the spirit, because if we just go on being filled with the spirit, we become like the Dead Sea. We've got water coming in and we become saltier and saltier until we eventually we die. But if we have water coming in and water, I swim in the serpentine here, which is pretty, looks pretty filthy, but actually it's clean because it's got water coming in and it's got water going out and we need the Holy Spirit coming in, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. 
and that the, the, the Holy Spirit is given that we might experience God's love. Of course, the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, but also he sends us out on uh, mission. So these three themes that Father Rhaenyra and, and each of the last three popes has emphasized, uh, evangelization, unity, and the Holy Spirit, I think they're very closely connected. And I think, um, I think the Catholic Church has led the way in the last few years on evangelization. And I think we need to follow that lead and all get involved in bringing the good news of Jesus to a world that desperately needs Jesus. Yeah. Nikki, thank you so much for that. Bishop Barron, Father James, you know, we, we could we could continue this conversation for so much longer. But I'm, you know, I'm just really struck in, in, in what you've shared there, Nikki, that, you know, we, we've got to come back to, to first principles. You know, Luke 24, when when Jesus told us to go make disciples, he said, wait until you are clothed with power from on high. So if we are listening for the sake of action, it's got to be action in the power of the Holy Spirit. So what I'd love to do now is, is move us to just a time of prayer, uh, a time to, to lift up in prayer, uh, all that we've heard here, but, but really to ask, to, to cry out to the Lord for the empowering of his Holy Spirit. So there's a church we both pray and then can go do in accordance with his will. And Bishop Barron, would you perhaps open us and then I, I, I know Father uh, James and Nikki will chip in as well. Let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we give you praise because you brought us together today and where we're gathered together we are living in your spirit. Heavenly Father, guide us in this great work of evangelization. The world is suffering as it always suffers, but our task is to be salt and to be light. So Father, give us the grace, send us, send us on the mission, on the mission you entrusted first to your son and now to us. Help us Lord to bring your presence, to bring your love, to bring your grace, to bring your peace to the world. And help us to fall in love more and more with one another because we know we're connected to each other in you, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Father, we praise you and thank you this day. Lord, I thank you for everyone who is united on this call today. Lord, I thank you for the, the Word on Fire team, for Bishop Barron and the incredible work that they do. Uh, touching countless hearts and minds all over the world uh, and bringing people to parishes who have watched their resources and engage with them. So we thank you and praise you for, for what they're doing. We ask you, Lord, to continue to bring forth fruit for the glory of your name. Lord, I thank you for the Alpha team throughout the world, for, for Nikki, for, for his, his congregation and all the ways in which you are using them. Lord, I thank you for the countless numbers of people on this call who lead parishes, who lead ministries, who are doing your work, who are laboring in the field. Lord, we pray that in this time of trial, this time of uncertainty, this time of fear, Lord, that you may purify our faith, that make it a faith that is more precious than, than gold, Lord, that you that by the genuineness of our faith, Lord, that we may live out of that genuineness and proclaim you and also lead your people to build up your kingdom, to come Holy Spirit, come upon our minds, come upon our hearts, and move us to action to be your church in the world. Mm. Amen. 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 Well, I'd love to pray um, the, that um, ancient, most ancient prayer of the church, come Holy Spirit. And if you forgive me quoting Cardinal Raniero Cantalamessa again, he often says, you know, this is the most ancient prayer of the church, but of, he, he talks about going to church in Italy. Uh, he says, you must pray this prayer with expectancy, expecting the Holy Spirit to come. And he said, often when you go to church in Italy, uh, at the end of the service, the end of the mass, you're, it's polite to turn to your neighbor and say, you must come round to my home. But it's said with no expectation that they'll come. They'd be horrified if they came. <laughs> and um, uh, he said, when we pray the prayer, come Holy Spirit, it should not be like that with no expectation that the Spirit will come. So I'd love us to pray this prayer, come Holy Spirit, with the expectation that the Holy Spirit is going to fill every one of you who have come on this call today. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is not confused by Zoom. Um, uh, 
some people think that the Holy Spirit is the only person who's not confused by Zoom, <laughs> but the Holy Spirit can come on Zoom. And um, I'd encourage you to receive and to open your heart. And sometimes, you know, it's very hard sometimes to know whether we have opened our heart, but one way to do it is to open our hands as um, uh, 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 Pope Benedict said when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, that the opening of our hands in worship is the most ancient form of prayer and opening ourselves to God. Um, and let's pray that prayer. We all desperately need the Holy Spirit uh, right now. The world needs the Holy Spirit. So Lord, that's our prayer today. Come Holy Spirit, come and fill each person on this call each of these 80 countries around the world. Come and fill the people of Ukraine, people of Russia, people of Belarus, people of the Baltic states, people of North America, South America, Asia, Europe, every part, India, every part of the world, China, where we need the Holy Spirit, a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And start with us, Lord, fill us. What I sense is that for, for some of you right now, this is like water on thirsty ground. The last couple of years have been very tough for you and the Holy Spirit wants to refresh you, refill you. Let him know that you are loved by God. when Jesus went up Mount Tabor uh, with the disciples. He revealed his glory, his face shone. And we can contemplate Jesus. We can look into his face today and be transformed you know, the experience of uh, the, this is for all of us um, St Paul writes we, we are being transformed into his likeness this comes from the spirit And we can go down from the mountain radiating Jesus to be Jesus, his hands, his feet, to a world that desperately needs the love of Jesus, compassion of Jesus. To receive his love, his joy, his peace. I think for some of you, it's been a real period of anxiety and fear. And right now, the Spirit of God is filling you with his peace. And the knowledge that he is with you. We declare Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. He is with you right now, Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much to all three of you for leading us in that time of prayer and, and just that encouragement to also keep crying out, come Holy Spirit, so we can continue to be filled for the sake of pouring out. 
And we hope for all of the, those of you who have been able to join us today, uh, whether online in our watch parties or, or watching back afterwards, that this event has really blessed you. And one of the things that with all of these webinars we want to do is to build up the church. And so to help us do that, we would just love to get a quick sense right now of what, if anything, you were taking away from today's webinar. So in a moment, you're going to see a, a poll pop up on the screen and it will have four options. The first bullet uh, says that in terms of this webinar, you know, it inspired you. That's number one. Number two is it inspired you and is giving you some ideas for what could be done. Number three, it's inspired you, giving you some ideas, and you intend to take action on evangelization and responding in faith to the current situation. Or option number four, it didn't inspire you. So just take a moment to click on the option that both best represents you know, what you're taking from this webinar. And we want to thank you so much for giving us your time today. It has been such a joy to be with you all and also to be with our speakers, uh, with Bishop Robert Barron, with Nikki Gumbel and with Father James Mallon. And Kitty, I'll hand over to you to now close us out with a couple of final announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. There are a couple of things that we would love to let you know about that are coming up. First, Alpha will be hosting our annual leadership conference on the 2nd and 3rd of May. And we would really love to invite you to join us there. It'll be two and a half hours long, online and free. And it's taking place four times with translation into 17 languages. So you really can join wherever you are in the world. To book your free ticket, you can go to leadershipconference.org.uk. And Divine Renovation would love to invite you to join them in prayer for parish renewal this Lent. As we've been saying, evangelization and parish renewal can seem a daunting task, but a great place to start is with prayer. So throughout Lent, Divine Renovation will share a daily prayer and reflection video by email to help you pray for the renewal of our parishes. And you can find out more at divinerenovation.org forward slash prayer. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much to our guest, Bishop Barron. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Father James. Thank you, Fiona. We've loved having everybody here with us for this webinar, and we are here to serve you. So please do be in touch and let us know how we can do that. God bless and enjoy the rest of your day.